Hello and welcome back to Scholastically Natalie, where today we're focusing on some old literature. Um, how exciting. <laughs> uh, we're looking at Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. Specifically from this, we're looking at the prologue because some lucky human, aka me, was forced to read it in my American Literature from 1945 class, so I still have the Norton Anthology of American Literature, the ninth edition, literature since 1945. And this is one of the pieces we had to read, and therefore it's stuck in my memory. Um, the prologue less so than the chapter one, um, which were the only two parts we had to read, and both of which still exposed us to quite a bit of interesting subject. So, to make things clear, this was written by Ralph Waldo Ellison, who was alive from 1914 to 1994. Any information about Ralph Ellison was taken from the brief introduction of the author before the story begins. So, notably, this is on page 190, Ellison called Invisible Man an attempt to return to the mood of personal moral responsibility for democracy, which typified the best of our 19th century fiction. Um, in other words, he's trying to turn us back to looking at people's own personal morals or what they take responsibility for, or what we're each responsible for with our own morals and how we should act and how we should be influenced by them. Um, he also said that the story was an imaginative recreation of certain aspects of our American life and the effect these have upon our personality. As such, it is to be read as a near allegory or an extended metaphor. The facts themselves are of no moment, are, for me, even amusing. So, if you don't feel like reading between the lines, he's saying that there are certain aspects of American life um, that will have an effect upon our personality, whatever we may go through during our journeys. And so for this and his own experiences, which specifically in this case would be around racism, um, he wrote this as an allegory or a metaphor. It's not a direct experience that he had, um, but one that could relate back to it and how he's taken feelings or people he's encountered and extended them into an almost joking look at them, or a grotesque, overly grotesque look at them. So let's begin with Invisible Man, the prologue. Um, there's a special note here that says, Rast the Destroyer, Reinhardt, and Brother Jack, which are mentioned in the prologue, are characters who will appear later in the novel. I am an invisible man. No, I am not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe, nor am I one of your Hollywood movie ectoplasms. I am a man of substance, of flesh and blown, bone, fiber, and liquids, and I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. Like the bodiless heads you see sometimes in circus sideshows, it is as though I have been surrounded by mirrors of hard, distorting glass. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings, themselves, or figments of their imagination, indeed everything and anything except me. Nor is my invisibility exactly a matter of a biochemical accident to my epidermis. That invisibility to which I refer occurs because of a peculiar disposition in the eyes of those with whom I come in contact. A matter of the construction of their inner eyes, those eyes with which they look through their physical eyes upon reality. I am not complaining, nor am I protesting either. It is sometimes advantageous to be unseen, though it is most often rather wearing on the nerves. Then, too, you're constantly being bumped against by those of poor vision. Or again, you often doubt if you really exist. You wonder whether you aren't simply a phantom in other people's minds. Say, a figure in a nightmare which the sleeper tries with all his strength to destroy. It's when you feel like this that, out of resentment, you begin to bump the people back. And let me confess, you feel that way most of the time. You ache with the need con to convince yourself that you do exist in the real world, that you're a part of all the sound and anguish, and you strike out with your fists. You curse and you swear to make them recognize you. And, alas, it's seldom successful. 
One night, I accidentally bumped into a man, and perhaps because of the near darkness, he saw me and called me an insulting name. He was a tall, blonde man, and as my face came close to his, he looked insolently out of his blue eyes and cursed me, his breath hot in my face as he struggled. I pulled his chin down sharp upon the crown of my head, butting him as I had seen the West Indians do, and felt his flesh tear and the blood gush out, and I yelled, Apologize. Apologize. But he continued to curse and struggle, and I butted him again and again, until he went down heavily, on his knees, profusely bleeding. I kicked him repeatedly, in a frenzy, because he still uttered insults, though his lips were frothy with blood. Oh yes, I kicked him. And in my outrage, I got out my knife and prepared to slit his throat, right there beneath the lamplight in the deserted street, holding him in the collar with one hand and opening the knife with my teeth. When it occurred to me that the man had not seen me, actually, that he, as far as he knew, was in the midst of a walking nightmare. And I stopped the blade, slicing the air as I pushed him away, letting him fall back to the street. I stared at him hard as the lights of a car stabbed through the darkness. He lay there, moaning on the asphalt, a man almost killed by a phantom. It unnerved me. I was both disgusted and ashamed. I was like a drunken man myself, wavering about on weakened legs. Then I was amused. Something in this man's thick head had sprung out and beaten him within an inch of his life. I began to laugh at this crazy discovery. Would he have awakened at the point of death? Would death himself have freed him for wakeful living? But I didn't linger. I ran away into the dark, laughing so hard I feared I might rupture myself. The next day I saw his picture in the Daily News beneath the caption stating that he had been mugged. Poor fool. Poor, blind fool, I thought, with sincere compassion. Mugged by an invisible man. Most of the time, although I do not choose as I once did to deny the violence of my days by ignoring it, I am not so overtly violent. I remember that I am invisible and walk softly so as to not awaken the sleeping ones. Sometimes it is best not to awaken them. There are few things in the world as dangerous as sleepwalkers. I learned in time, though, it is possible to carry on a fight against them without their realizing it. For instance, I have been carrying on a fight with monopoly, monopolated light and power for some time now. I use their service and pay them nothing at all, and they don't know it. Oh, they suspect that power is being drained off, but they don't know where. All they know is that according to the master meter back there in their power station, a hell of a lot of free current is disappearing somewhere into the jungle of Harlem. The joke, of course, is that I don't live in Harlem, but in a border area. Several years ago, before I discovered the advantages of being invisible, I went through the routine process of buying service and paying their outrageous rates, but no more. I gave up all that along with my apartment and my old way of life. That way, based upon the fallacious assumption that I, like other men, was visible. Now, aware of my invisibility, I live rent-free in a building rented strictly to whites, in a section of the basement that was shut off and forgotten during the 19th century, which I discovered when I was trying to escape in the night from Ras the Destroyer. But that's getting too far ahead of the story, almost to the end, though the end is the beginning and lies far ahead. The point now is that I found a home, or a hole in the ground, as you will. Now, don't jump to the conclusion that because I call my home a hole, it is damp and cold like a grave. There are cold holes and warm holes. Mine is a warm hole. And remember, a bear retires to his hole for the winter and lives until spring. Then he comes strolling out like the Easter chick breaking from its shell. I say all this to assure you that it is incorrect to assume that, because I'm invisible and live in a hole, I am dead. I am neither dead nor in a state of suspended animation. Call me Jack the Bear, for I am in a state of hibernation. My hole is warm and full of light. Yes, full of light. I doubt if there is a brighter spot in all New York than this hole of mine, and I do not exclude Broadway or the Empire State Building on a photographer's dream night, but that is taking advantage of you. Those two spots are among the darkest of our whole civilization. Pardon me, our whole culture, an important distinction I've heard, which might sound like a hoax or a contradiction, but that, by contradiction I mean, is how the world moves, not like an arrow, but a boomerang. Beware of those who speak of the spiral of history. They are preparing a boomerang. Keep a steel helmet handy. I know I have been boomeranged across my head so much that I can now see the darkness of lightness. And I love light. 
Perhaps you'll think it strange that an invisible man should need light, desire light, love light. But maybe it is exactly because I am invisible. Light confirms my reality, gives birth to my form. A beautiful girl once told me of a recurring nightmare in which she lays in the center of a large dark room and felt her face expand until it filled up filled the whole room, becoming a formless mass, while her eyes ran in bilious jelly up the chimney. And so it is with me. Without light, I am not only invisible, but formless as well, and to be unaware of one's form is to live a death. I myself, after existing some twenty years, did not become alive until I discovered my invisibility. That is why I fight my battle with monopolated light and power, the deeper reason I mean. It allows me to feel my vital aliveness. I also fight them for taking so much of my money before I learn to protect myself. In my hole in the basement, there are exactly 1,369 lights. I've wired the entire ceiling, every inch of it, and not with fluorescent bulbs, but with the older, more expensive to operate kind, the filament type. In active sabotage, you know, I've already begun to wire the wall. A junk man I know, a man of vision, has supplied me with wire and sockets. Nothing, storm or flood, must get in the way of our need for light, and ever more and brighter light. The truth is the light, and light is the truth. When I finish all four walls, then I'll start on the floor. Just how that will go, I don't know. Yet when you have lived invisible as long as I have, you develop a certain ingenuity. I'll solve the problem, and maybe I'll invent a gadget to place my coffee pot on the fire while I lie in bed, and even invent a gadget to warm my bed like the fellow I saw in one of the picture magazines, who made himself a gadget to warm his shoes. Though invisible, I am in the great American tradition of tinkers. That makes me kin to Ford, Edison, and Franklin. Call me, since I have a theory and a concept, a thinker-tinker. Yes, I'll warm my shoes. They need it. They're usually full of holes. I'll do that, and more. Now, I have one radio phonograph. I plan to have five. There is a certain acoustical deadness in my hole, and when I have music, I want to feel its vibration, not only with my ear, but with my whole body. I'd like to hear five recordings of Louis Armstrong playing and singing What Did I Do to Be So Black and Blue all at the same time. Sometimes now I listen to Louis while I have my favorite dessert of vanilla ice cream and slow gin. I pour the red liquid over the white mound, watching it glisten and the vapor rising as Louis bends that military instrument into a beam of lyrical sound. Perhaps I like Louis Armstrong because he's made poetry out of being invisible. I think it must be because he is unaware that he is invisible, and my own grasp of invisibility aids me to understand his music. Once when I asked for a cigarette, some jokers gave me a reefer, which I lighted when I got home and sat listening to my phonograph. It was a strange evening. Invisibility, let me explain, gives one a slightly different sense of time. You're never quite on the beat. Sometimes you're ahead and sometimes behind. Instead of the swift and imperceptible flowing of time, you are aware of its nodes, those points where time stands still or from which it leaps ahead. And you slip into the breaks and look around. That's what you hear, vaguely, in Lewis's music. In Louis's music, sorry. Once I saw a prize fighter boxing a yokel, the fighter was swift and amazingly scientific. His body was one violent flow of rapid rhythmic action. He hit the yokel a hundred times when the yokel held up his arms in stunned surprise. But suddenly the yokel, rolling about in the gale of boxing gloves, struck one blow and knocked science, speed, and footwork as cold as a well digger's posterior. The smart money hit the canvas. The long shot got the nod. The yokel had simply stepped inside of his opponent's sense of time. So, under the spell of the reefer, I discovered a new analytical way of listening to music. The unheard sounds came through, and each melodic line existed of itself, stood out clearly from all the rest, set its peace, and waited patiently for the other voices to speak. That night I found myself hearing, not only in time, but in space as well. I not only entered the music, but descended, like Dante, into its depths. And beneath the swiftness of the hot tempo there was a slower tempo, and a cave, and I entered it and looked around and heard an old woman singing a spiritual as full of Welsh mirth as flamenco, and beneath that lay, still, lay a still lower level on which I saw a beautiful girl, the color of ivory, pleading in a voice like my mother's as she stood before a group of slave owners who bid for her naked body, and below that I found a lower level and a more rapid tempo, and I heard someone shout, 
Brothers and sisters, my text this morning is the blackness of blackness. And a congregation of voices answered, That blackness is most black, brother, most black. In the beginning, at the very start, they cried, There was blackness. Preach it, and the sun, the sun lord, was blood red, red. Now black is, the preacher shouted, bloody. I said black is, preach it, brother. And black ain't, red, lord, red, he said it's red. Amen, brother, black will get you, yes it will, and black won't. Now it won't. It do, it do, lord, and it don't. Hallelujah. I'll put you glory, glory, O oh my Lord, in the whale's belly. Preach it, dear brother, and make you tempt. Good God Almighty, old Aunt Nellie, black will make you black, or black will unmake you. Ain't it the truth, Lord? And at that point, a voice of trombone timber screamed at me, Get out of here, you fool, is you ready to commit treason? And I tore myself away, hearing the old singer of spirituals moaning, Go curse your God, boy, and die. I stopped and questioned her and asked her what was wrong. I dearly loved my master, son, she said. You should have hated him, I said. He gave me several sons, she said. And because I loved my sons, I learned to love their father, though I hated him, too. I, too, have become acquainted with the ambivalence, I said. That's why I'm here. What's that? Nothing. A word that doesn't explain it. Why do you moan? I moan this way because he's dead, she said. Then tell me, who is that laughing upstairs? Them's my sons. They glad. Yes, I can understand that too, I said. I laughs too, but I moans too. He promised to set us free, but he never could bring himself to do it. Still, I loved him. Loved him? You mean? Oh yes, but I loved something else even more. What more? Freedom. Freedom, I said. Maybe freedom lies in hating. Nah, son, it's in loving. I loved him and gave him the poison, and he withered away like a frostbit apple. Them boys would have torn him to pieces with they homemade knives. A mistake was made somewhere, I said. I'm confused. And I wished to say other things, but the laughter upstairs became too loud and moan-like for me, and I tried to break out of it, but I couldn't. Just as I was leaving, I felt an urgent desire to ask her what freedom was, and went back. She sat with her head in her hands, moaning softly. Her leather-brown face was filled with sadness. Old woman, what is this freedom you love so well? I asked around a corner of my mind. She looked surprised, then thoughtful, then baffled. I done forgot, son. It's all mixed up. First I think it's one thing, then I think it's another. It gets my head to spinning. I guess now it ain't nothing but knowing how to say what I got up in my head. But it's a hard job, son. Too much is done happened to me in too short a time. It gets like I have a fever. Every time I start to walk, my head gets to swelling and I falls down. Or if it ain't that, it's the boys. They gets to laughing and want to kill up the white folks. He's bitter, that's what they is. But what about freedom? Leave me alone, boy. My head aches. I left her, feeling dizzy myself. I didn't get far. Suddenly, one of the sons, a big fellow six feet tall, appeared out of nowhere and struck me with his fist. What's the matter, man? I cried. You made Ma cry. But how? I said, dodging a blow. Asking her questions. That's how. Get out of here and stay, and next time you got questions like that, ask yourself. He held me in a grip like cold stone, his fingers fastening upon my windpipe until I thought I would suffocate before he finally allowed me to go. I stumbled about dazed, the music beating hysterically in my ears. It was dark. My head cleared and I wandered down a dark, narrow passage, thinking I heard his footsteps hurrying behind me. I was sore, and into my being had come a profound craving for tranquility, for peace and quiet, a state I felt I could never achieve. For one thing, the trumpet was blaring and the rhythm was too hectic. A tom-tom beating like heart thuds began drowning out the trumpet, filling my ears. I longed for water, and I heard it rushing through the cold manes my fingers touched as I felt my way, but I couldn't stop to search because of the footsteps behind me. Hey, Rass, I called. Is it you, Destroyer? Reinhardt? No answer. Only the rhythmic footsteps behind me. Once, I tried crossing the road, but a speeding machine struck me, scraping the skin from my leg as it roared past. Then somehow I came out of it, ascending hastily from this underworld of sound to hear Louis Armstrong innocently asking, What did I do to be so black and blue? At first, I was afraid. This familiar music had demanded action, the kind of which I was incapable. And yet, I had, and yet had I lingered there beneath the surface, I might have attempted to act. Nevertheless, I know now that few really listen to this music. 
I sat on the chair's edge so in a soaking sweat, as though each of my 1,369 bulbs had everyone become a Clegg light, which is a uh, light used in making movies, in an individual setting for a third degree with Rass and Reinhardt in charge. It was exhausting, as though I had held my breath continuously for an hour under the terrifying serenity that comes from days of intense hunger. And yet, it was a strangely satisfying experience for an invisible man to hear the silence of sound. I had discovered unrecognized compulsions of my being, even though I could not answer yes to their promptings. I haven't smoked a reefer since, however, not because they're illegal, but because to see around corners is enough. That is not unusual when you're invisible. But to hear around them is too much. It inhibits action. And despite Brother Jack and all that sad, lost period of the Brotherhood, I believe in nothing if not in action. Please, a definition. A hibernation is a covert preparation for more overt action. Besides, the drug destroys one's sense of time completely. If that happened, I might forget to dodge some bright morning and some cluck would run me down with an orange and yellow streetcar or a bilious bus, or I might forget to leave my home when the moment for action presents itself. Meanwhile, I enjoy my life with the compliments of monopolated light and power. Since you never recognize me even when in closest contact with me, and since no doubt you'll hardly believe that I exist, it won't matter if you know that I tapped a power line leading into the building and ran it into my hole in the ground. Before that I lived in the darkness into which I was chased, but now I see. I have illuminated the blackness of my invisibility, and vice versa. And so I play the invisible music of my isolation. The last statement doesn't seem just right, does it? But it is. You hear this music simply because music is heard and seldom seen, except by musicians. Could this compulsion to put invisibility down in black and white be thus an urge to make music of invisibility? But I am an orator, a rabble-rouser. Am? I was, and perhaps shall be again. Who knows? All sickness is not unto death. Neither is invisibility. I can hear you say, what a horrible, irresponsible bastard. And you're right. I leap to agree with you. I am one of the most irresponsible beings that ever live. Irresponsibility is part of my invisibility. Anyway, you face it. It is a denial. But to whom can I be responsible, and why would I be when you refuse to see me? And wait until I reveal how truly irresponsible I am. Responsibility rests upon recognition, and recognition is a form of agreement. Take the man whom I almost killed. Who was responsible for that new murder? I? I don't think so, and I refute it. I won't buy it. You can't give it to me. He bumped me. He insulted me. Shouldn't he, for his own personal safety, have recognized my hysteria, my danger potential? He, let us say, was lost in a dream world, but didn't he control that dream world, which, alas, is only too real? And didn't he rule me out of it? And if he had yelled for a policeman, wouldn't I have been taken for the offending one? Yes, yes, yes. Let me agree with you. I was the irresponsible one, for I should have used my knife to protect the higher interests of society. Some day that kind of foolishness will cause us tragic trouble. All dreamers and sleepwalkers must pay the price, and even the invisible victim is responsible for the fate of all. But I shirked that responsibility. I became too snarled in the incompatible notions that buzzed within my brain. I was a coward. But what did I do to be so blue? Bear with me. And that is the end of the prologue. I'm going to take a drink. Because although it is short, that was a lot of words, man. I almost don't think it's that long, and then it's just like, oh, right, I forgot. Um, when you're reading older writing, they actually get really descriptive, which I love. I adore this kind of writing. Um, However, this extremely detailed writing will not serve us if we read chapter one. Um, kind of debating if I should do that one before we do Going to Meet the Man, because Going to Meet the Man is rough. <laughs> that one has just stuck in my brains. Um, but here, I would like to discuss some parts of it. I do have my quotes that I highlighted, but honestly, those were just really good quotes that stuck out to me. Um, but honestly, the most meaningful, one of the most meaningful, I don't, I think there's a lot of meaningful parts of this prologue. For all that he says that, like, this stuff doesn't really matter, it, it's most definitely layered very well. It's a great metaphor, or, like, what was the word he used? I've forgotten now. 
<laughs> it's a good metaphor. Um, the main one that we mainly focused on, of course, was the descent into the music. Um, in case you don't know, a reefer is a code word for, you know, weed, um, a blunt. And so he was saying that when he smokes and listens to Louis Armstrong, or is it Louis Armstrong? Have I been calling him by the wrong name this entire time? Oh, sorry, I'm just smacking everything. <sighs> I don't know how to live with this headset. <laughs> um, because he, he says that he descends into the music. And so this is obviously a sort of like weed-based hallucination that um, at first takes us through kind of more modern times until we go to the past where we, specifically the one focus was a woman with ivory skin pleading in a voice like my mother's as she stood before a group of slave owners who bid for her naked body. Um, because that one was expressly pointing out that if you were even born from slaves, despite even presenting as white, you would still be sold as a slave because it wasn't really about skin color, it was just about domination, which I think is interesting. Or perhaps even dehumanization, I should say, not just domination, it was truly dehumanizing. Um, and I thought that was interesting, or at least a very interesting example to use here. Um, and then we get to the really weird, um, the text on the blackness of blackness um, that was written like a church response, um, like the the more stereotypical uh, example of a black person's church. I don't know if, you know, with the full choir and everybody's very responsive, like stereotypical uh, white-led churches uh, are generally very quiet during sermons, and at least in depictions that I've seen, because I haven't attended one um, of black people's churches, is that it's very responsive, um, very call-and-response sort of way that it goes. And the entire dialogue is here is trapped between a preacher and a congregation, which I think is interesting, because... Um, it really sounds, it doesn't sound like much when you first read it. <laughs> and then it kind of talks about maybe the destruction of the black community. I don't know. It was very interesting. I, I haven't read into it enough. Just the, the transition from invoking God the entire time for like sacrifices. There is a lot of mention of sacrifices, specifically they say in the whale's belly, like Jonah and the whale, where you basically had to put yourself in a terrible situation and trust in God to get you out of it. Um, I think that's a very specific and interesting reference. Um, then we meet with the slave who has murdered her master to set herself and her sons free and is confused because she both loves and hates the master, which, again, interesting, very Stockholm-y. Um, and the thought of she loved him and so she poisoned him rather than letting her sons murder him, like, brutally and viciously. That's another thing that I thought was very interesting, like this kind of divide where even loving someone can't save them because they are still irredeemable, but you can at least give them a painless death. I think that was very interesting, and just the expression of aggression towards anybody other than your immediate family group, I think, is interesting. I don't know. <laughs> the prologue has so much to say, even though it's only, like, six pages. <laughs> and that's just in the flashback sequence. Um, I deeply enjoy, like, the philosophical discussions of being invisible to a society that, like, doesn't value you and doesn't think you're worth anything, and so, therefore, everybody around you is sleeping and is dreaming and is sleepwalking, and encountering you is truly just a nightmare for them. It's not reality. 
um, because they don't think you really exist or you can do anything. Um, I do find that fascinating um, and very, very interesting. It's just such a way, um, it really is such a way to introduce the book. Um, I don't know, I think all of this is very interesting. I definitely think that despite Ralph <laughs> saying that to him this is the, the, the moments can even be funny, I do agree with parts of that. The next chapter is better. Can we read it? <laughs> I don't know. I think there's a lot that this prologue is saying um, that maybe I'm not even articulating very well because it's complicated. I don't really know how to put all my thoughts out there. Um, like, feeling like you don't exist unless you have light on you. And because you can't be acknowledged by the people that oppress you because you aren't seen as a human, you have to provide your own light to become someone. I, I think that's a very powerful and interesting concept. And then also having to wait, having to hibernate um, until you have time and a plan and people to perform more overt action, as the prologue says. That too is always, I mean, it's interesting, and they are right, because you do have to be able to meet up with people and plan and then also be mildly safe to move and make action and make yourself seen and heard and break people out of their dream state. I don't know, I just, I love the, I just love the concept of like, the people around you are dreaming, um, that they're ignoring anything that complicates their worldview, or that might conflict with how they think the world works, and they just regard it as a nightmare and an exception. And not something that could be happening all the time. I don't know. I think that's all very interesting. <laughs> Sorry if this is a kind of rambly video after the prologue. I just, I have a lot of thoughts that I don't have any like super concrete opinions on. So let me know the, in the comments like what you think about this. Um, if you have any opinions on people being in dream states and having to be forcefully woken from them or their or even what you think the uh, Reefer and Louis Armstrong moment, what you think that was even saying. Um, I don't know. I think it's very interesting. I also think it's interesting that Ralph kind of introduced us to the concept of blackness equaling invisibility in the prologue, at least. Um, I find that interesting as well. <laughs> so please let me know what you think let me know if you liked this let me know if you didn't like this am i being too indecisive on interpreting the book <sighs> okay the main thing is that i don't want to say that this only means this i don't want to say that this has to mean this um and i don't have any true certain interpretations of it right now um but i never want to be a person that's like there's only one way to interpret a book i think there's many ways to interpret a book um especially when it's written with such flowy and masterful language as Invisible Man is. So let me know what you think. Let me know how you interpreted the prologue. Um, <laughs> because I am always fascinated by this sort of writing and its perspective. Uh, anyways, if you like this video, leave me a like. Um, if you're interested in seeing more from me, please subscribe. Um, and if you have any constructive criticism, let me know. I'm sorry if I've accidentally been making too much or too little noise. I, this is only my second recording with this weird gaming headset, and I know that I've touched it at least once. Um, my apologies. I need something to do with my hands when I'm talking. <laughs> I was flipping the pages of the book, and now that I've closed it, I don't have anything to do with my hands. Okay. I will see you guys in the next one, and I hope this was an enjoyable video for you. Scholastically Natalie is...